Heavenly Father, we are so honored to be here this morning, to be among those whom you have redeemed. You have bought for yourself a chosen possession. We would be zealous for good works. And we're so thankful, Lord, to be able to come today to your word, which is perfect, which heals the soul, which makes us wise. In your word, we have everything that we need for life and godliness because through it we have the knowledge of Christ. And we pray that you would use this time in our lives, that you would help us in these moments to be able to pay attention and understand what you have for us in this text. And we pray that you would work in our hearts, Lord. It's it's a constant prayer. We repeat it so often because we need you to work in us. We need you to continue molding us into the likeness of Christ. We need you to continue showing us more of the glory of Christ because we know that that's essential in the work that you do in molding us into his image is seeing him for who he is, that we may worship him, that we may grow in imitating our Savior. It's in his name we pray, amen. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to John chapter 7. We're going to be looking at verses 40 through 52. John chapter 7. Life is full of dilemmas, isn't it? A dilemma is a choice that you come to where it's very hard to make. The reason it's hard to make the choice is because you want both things. Or maybe you want neither things, but you have to choose one. It's a hard choice. There's a price to pay no matter what you choose. You have two options. You want both, and you can only choose one. You can't have it all, and something must be sacrificed. That's a dilemma. We have dilemmas all the time in our daily life where we have to make a choice. We have to choose between several options. In the passage before us, we have Jesus inviting, the passage before this one, I'm sorry, we have Jesus inviting us to come, those who thirst to come to Him, to drink, to satisfy, to quench our thirst in Him, and the promise that Springs of water will flow from within us for our own satisfaction and for ministering to others. But this passage we're going to look at now, that teaching that Jesus gave, those pronouncements, put people in a a dilemma. It made it difficult for them. And I don't know if you've ever realized that God is the best storyteller. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Sometimes people, when they want to learn how to write stories, they go to the Bible. And they analyze the stories in the Bible because they're so well written. Now we know they're well written because God fashioned that story. He orchestrated the actual events that are written in the Word. And He is a great, great storyteller. He's the best storyteller. We have amazing stories in the Bible In our passage today, we see the narrative go forward with three different dialogues. It's a a, a well-written story that's playing out. And we have three scenes, like a play, like scenes of a play, if you will. The curtain comes down, everything's changed around, the curtain comes up, and the next uh, scene is happening. Three scenes in our passage today each of them made up primarily of a dialogue. And in each scene, we have several elements. We have several elements that make up the scene. First, there's a favorable response to Christ. Someone has a response to Christ that is favorable, or at least it's not bad, or neutral. Then, we see that that response is going to be met with opposition. Someone is pushing back on this 
person or group of people that had the favorable response to Christ. And in their pushback, they're going to give an argument as to why the other person or people are wrong. And also, there's going to be a dilemma. A dilemma for the person that has the favorable response to Christ. In our story today, there's a lot of irony. Irony is a literary technique by which the full significance of the character's words or actions are clear to the audience or reader, though unknown to the characters. So we're going to see the irony that plays out here as we go through these three scenes. Today we're going to see different costs of following Christ so that we may consider whether we are counting the cost in our own lives. So that's going, this is going to be our outline. Three scenes, three dilemmas, however you want to, you want to uh, label it. The first one is the crowd. Verses 40 through 44, we see the dilemma of the crowd. The second one, the officers. In verses 45 through 49. And the third one is going to be Nicodemus. Verses 50 to 52. So the crowd, the officers, and Nicodemus. Let's go ahead and read our passage. We're in John chapter 7, reading verses 40 through 52. When they heard these words, some of the people said, This really is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the Scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, No one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. So the first scene we have is a dialogue within the crowd. Jesus has pronounced at the end of the feast, after the ceremony, He's declared an invitation that anyone that comes to Him, that the thirsty should come to Him and drink. And the very next thing we have is this dialogue within the crowd. And the first thing we see is a favorable response in verse 40 and the first part of verse 41. Some people said, this really is the prophet. And others said, this is the Christ. So notice there at the beginning of verse 40, it says, when they heard these words, when they heard these words. Many times we see Jesus preaching. We see Jesus doing miracles. But usually they're responding to the miracles. They believe because of the miracles or they don't believe. But it doesn't say anything about his message. Here, we see that the response is to the words, to the message. At this point, he didn't do any miracle. He was just teaching and proclaiming the truth. And so it's more substantial than, I believe, those that saw his works and were convinced because of his works, um, because of his signs. Here, the belief or rejection is based on the message. And one of the responses that they have to Christ is this is truly, or this is really, the prophet. Now, we remember that this has already come up before as we work through John, because when they went to John the Baptist to question him, they asked him, one of the things they asked him 
was, are you the prophet? And we talked about how they would understand Deuteronomy 18.15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me, Moses speaking, from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And we saw that they asked him back then, when, when those, that council went to John the Baptist and were trying to figure out who he was, they asked him, are you the Messiah? They also asked him, are you the prophet? Because it appears that they believed that these two figures were different. That the Messiah was not the same one that Moses was referring to here, but that there was a prophet and a separate Messiah. And so here we see the same thing. Some say he's the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. And we remember the Christ is just the Greek word for the Messiah, which is a Hebrew word that means anointed. The anointed one. The awaited deliverer. Okay? When we read that, we think, well, they, they think he's the Messiah. They believe in him. Well, we have to understand what they understood by the Messiah, right? And we've talked about this. That their view of the Messiah was a temporal redeemer. A political figure that would redeem them. And didn't, weren't thinking, as we, as we see in these texts, the full understanding of who Christ, who the Messiah really was, and what kind of salvation He was going to bring, or He brought. So this isn't necessarily a saving faith. But we see this positive reaction. They're favorable to Christ. They believe Him to be true. They believe Him to be a prophet or the Messiah. But we also see here that this is met with opposition. Look at the second part of verse 41. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? And the way it's translated in the Greek, it's a little bit stronger. Such as, no, the Messiah is not going to come from Galilee, is he? It's more of a contradiction, like, why are you guys saying he's the Messiah? The Messiah is not going to come from Galilee. And so there's opposition here. It's not an honest question that they're asking, but it's a challenge. It's an argument. Look at verse 42. Has not the Scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So they're saying, okay, hold up. You're saying he's the Christ, he's not. And this is why. First premise. The scriptures say the Messiah will be from David's line and from Bethlehem. And we know this, right? There's lots of scriptures we could look at. We could look at Micah 5, 2 through 5, Jeremiah 23, 5, other scriptures as well. We know that that that's a true statement. Their first premise is true. Second premise. Jesus is from Galilee, not Bethlehem. Okay, so the Messiah is coming from Bethlehem, from the line of David. Jesus is from Galilee. He's not from Bethlehem. Therefore, Jesus is not the Messiah. That's their argument. That's their logic. This is the argument that they are putting forth to convince these other folks that Jesus is not the Messiah. But their logic is wrong. We know that Jesus is the Messiah, but let's look at their argument. What's wrong about it? Well, their first point is true. The scripture did say that Jesus was from Bethlehem and from David's line. So that part, okay, they're okay there. They're okay there. What about the second one? Well, something that they didn't consider is that the scriptures do say that Jesus is from Bethlehem. But there's other scriptures that indicate that he's also from Galilee. Look with me at Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2 verse 23. Matthew 2.23 says, And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, 
that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, he shall be called a Nazarene. So the scriptures prophesy that Jesus is going to be from Nazareth, and Nazareth is where? In Galilee. That's not the only one. Turn over the page to Matthew 4, 13 through 16. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. Capernaum is another city in Galilee. So their first premise is it's right, but it's not complete, right? Because the scripture also prophesied that Jesus would be um, from Galilee, from these towns, and, or at least that he would be in these towns. Not that he was born there, because he was born in Bethlehem, but that he would be from those, those places. So that is, is wrong. The, their, their argument for him is wrong. And um, if they wanted to investigate that, they could have, right? Could they not have asked Jesus or one of his disciples? Could they not investigate it further where he was born? Yes, but they were happy to have this false logic and stand behind it for the reason that they were not believing in Christ. So the truth that our Lord proclaimed about himself appeared to contradict what they believed to be true. That was the dilemma, right? They should have been in a dilemma at this point. But the information that Christ was saying appeared to contradict what they knew, what they already believed. And so they arrogantly assumed that they were correct and that Christ was wrong. And think about how many people have false logic they stand behind. If you go and talk to people about Christ, what are some of the reasons people are going to give you for not believing? Well, you know what? I had a neighbor and he was a Christian and he was a horrible person. So they disqualify the Bible and Christianity because they had a neighbor that claimed to be a Christian that was an awful person. Do you see how, how bad that logic is? According to that logic, you can discredit anything. The fact that this person claims to be a Christian and acts like that doesn't mean that Christianity is wrong. That's not a logical argument. People will grab onto anything that appears to be logical, and many people don't even need an argument. But those that do, they'll have certain arguments like that, you know. Uh, the Bible was written by, you know, it was just something made up by a bunch of men in this century or that century. They don't, they don't investigate, they don't want to know, they have some sort of false logic that they use to continue rejecting Christ. So what's the irony in this scene? Well, there's, there's several points of irony. Even the ones that were right about Christ didn't have the full picture, right? The fact that they were divided between some saying he's the prophet and some the Christ indicates they didn't really know. They didn't really understand who he was, even though they had a favorable opinion of him. And those who knew the scripture, think about that. Those who were bringing the Bible into the discussion are actually the ones that are wrong because they're the ones discrediting Christ completely. So there's a lot of irony in this that these biblical Jewish people in the crowd were the ones that were discrediting Christ. But there's some application here for us as well, right? Because many times we come to the same dilemma. In believing and obeying the Lord, we often come to a point of decision. Because we don't know everything. And as we look to what the Scripture tells us to do and believe, many times we are going to come to a point where it doesn't make sense to us. Just like it didn't make sense to these people that Jesus was the Messiah. And here we need to consider whether we trust in Christ or trust in our own intellect, our own knowledge, the information that we assume to be 
correct. You know, in the military, there's, um, there's big consequences for disobeying a lawful command, right? In the military, if you think about it, in a war, and there's a general, right? There's these generals that see the whole battle, all the battles, and they're making decisions, and they tell the other, the people under them, do this, do that, and they have a picture of where they are, and they're making decisions. Do you think when they tell the soldiers, go advance here, when you get here, shoot these people, do this, set a bomb here, whatever it is they're telling them to do, do you think the person is like, well, I don't really understand why we're doing that. Um, can you explain that to me? No. There's no explanation. There's a command, and they do it. And if they don't do it, there's big consequences because the person above them has a bigger picture. And he's not going to take the time to explain everything to that person. They have to obey a lawful command. That's how it works. Well, that's the same thing when we come to the Scriptures and see, and see things that we must do. When the Scriptures, for example, this morning in Sunday school, speak the truth in love, the Scriptures tell us to do that. Do we think, well, in this situation exactly, Lord, I don't think it's a good idea to speak the truth in love because it's not going to work out. The scripture says something, it's our job to do it. The outcome of that we leave in the Lord's hands. But if we're honest, while we're studying the Scripture, while we're reading it, we are challenged and we have dilemmas of what are we going to do. Are we going to trust ourselves or trust God? This section ends with verses 43 and 44. It says, There arose a division among the people over him, and those who wanted to seize him were not able. Jesus comes as a dividing force. You say, well, that doesn't sound very Christian. We should be about unity, not about division. But he's a dividing force in that some are going to believe him and some are not. And now there's a problem. There's a conflict. Matthew 10.34 says, Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. That's what Jesus says. And so we've seen here that this crowd, they were all listening to the Lord, and He finished, and now they start talking amongst themselves, and there's a division in the crowd. A division arose. But this isn't the only place in Jerusalem where this conflict is happening. It's happening all over Jerusalem. Jesus has been the talk of the town. His miracles, where He's from, what He's been doing, His teaching, everybody's talking about this. And this same conflict and dilemma is happening in different places. So we go from the crowd to now the curtain closes and when the curtain goes up again or opens up, we have a totally different scene. Where are we? Well, we're at a place that's totally different from where the crowd was and it's wherever the officers reported back to the religious leaders. So in my imagination, I see a big official building and the religious leaders are inside talking, and the officers come in to report back to the religious leaders. It's in a totally different, different scene here, right? And that's the next group that we look at is the officers. In verses 46 to 49, the officers reported back without carrying out their orders, which, they, which were to arrest Jesus. Right? We saw that. We saw that before in a previous sermon that they were sent to arrest Christ. The religious leaders had had enough of it and they had sent them to arrest Him. In verse 32 of this same chapter, it says the Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about Him and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest Him. So in verse 32, they sent the officers here they're coming back to report back. And when they come back, the chief priests are there and the rulers, and here come in the officers, but guess what? There's no Jesus. Their orders were apprehend Jesus and bring him, and they're showing up empty-handed. 
The questioning indicates their annoyance and an expectation that they had the ability to bring him back. Right? Look at it there in verse, 40, in verse 45. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why did you not bring him? They don't wait for the officers to talk. The rulers start first and they say, Why didn't you bring Jesus? It's not like they saw what was happening in the crowd and the teaching and they understood why they didn't bring him. They expected them to bring Christ, which indicates it's not a question of ability, it's a question of will. Right? Because they knew, they sent out these guys, they're armed, they're, they're guards, they're the servants that go do the beckoning of the temple, they're Levites, they're trained, and they had the ability, the authority, everything to bring Jesus, and He's not here. So what is going on? And the answer in verse 46, the officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. You know, they, had, they were a little different than the Pharisees and the rulers. The Pharisees and rulers hated Christ. They wanted Him dead. These officers weren't in the same situation. They didn't share that hate for Christ. They went because they were told to go, and their desire was to obviously please those who sent them, but they weren't fueled by hate. And when they went, they recognized the uniqueness of Christ. They're in Jerusalem. They've heard teachers and scribes and rabbis all their life. You wanted to be anybody in academia, religious academia, you went to Jerusalem. They've heard many people. And they said, no one ever spoke like this man. What was it about Christ and the way He spoke, the way He taught, that they were amazed by? that made him unique. Well, it doesn't specifically tell us, but in Mark 1.22 it says, And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Think about that. How many times, even in this sermon, I've had to say, well, it's likely, it's probably, my understanding of this text is, Jesus never said that. Never. What he said was truth. He spoke with the authority of God. And that made him unlike any other preacher. He never had to talk about his opinion or he thinks. It was 100% certain when he spoke. Not only was his authority and certainty, he knew the Scriptures perfectly. If you ask me a tricky things about the Scriptures, I don't know. I could say, well, I've studied it and I think this. There was nothing they could ask Christ that He couldn't answer. He interpreted everything correctly. It was His Word. Was it not? And by this time, they've already brought to Him their theological conundrums, their unsolvable riddles, their tricky questions, and He answered everything. And what a contrast Christ is with everybody else in this passage, right? We're going through this passage and all we see is ignorance. They don't understand who the prophet was. They don't understand who the Messiah was. The, the rulers that are supposed to know what's going on, they get it all wrong. There's ignorance everywhere in this passage. And you contrast that with Christ. Perfect knowledge. 100% authoritative on everything that he said. So these officers had a dilemma. They were sent to arrest Christ, and then as they're listening to His teaching and what He's saying, they, they understand this isn't right. It's not like they're going to arrest a criminal and they can do that with full conviction. They're sent to arrest Jesus and He's, he's teaching and preaching, and it just, this isn't right. They can't do it. They're unable to do it because of this Dilemma. They're internally conflicted about Christ. But the, the rulers are not going to leave it at that. They're not going to leave it at that. 
These men had been sent to arrest Jesus and they didn't do it. And they understand it's not because they couldn't physically do it. It's because they didn't want to. It was something else. And so they turn on them. And, and basically they're saying, you haven't been tricked also, have you? Have you also been tricked? I mean, you guys, you guys are Levites, you guys are trained, you guys are our right hand mans. You guys go out and do our work. Have they tricked you also? Are you that stupid that, they, that Jesus deceived you too? I mean, this is, this is, this is serious. Have you not, have you also been deceived? And then you can almost imagine, it doesn't say what these guys answered. Maybe they didn't answer. Maybe they were just silent. They didn't know what to say. What are we going to say now? Or maybe they said something that was lame. Maybe they were just defending their point in some way. But it doesn't even mention what they say. But we can imagine that what they said wasn't very good based on what follows which is the argument against Christ. And it says, verse 48, Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in Him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. This is their argument. None of those of us who know the law have believed in Jesus. And the people that have believed in Jesus are the ignorant people that don't know the law. So their argument is, if the people that know what's up have not believed in Him, and the people that don't know what's up have believed in Him, it just shows that He's a fraud. He's a deceiver. And really, at this time, they had a phrase that they would use for the crowd, for the populace, for the ignorant, which weren't that ignorant. They, as we can see, they knew their scriptures. They, they brought that out. But they talked, they had a word that they would use, they were people of the earth. And if you look in the rabbinical writings, they really despise the people of the earth. These ignorant people, we're not like them. We're better than them. These people are accursed, it says, accursed. And they ridicule these guards and show disrespect for the people. And these were the shepherds of Israel, right? These were the leaders of of Israel, the shepherds of these people. They should have loved the crowd, right? They should have loved the people they were leading. They were to care for them. They were under shepherds caring for the flock. And instead they ridicule, despise, and malign the people. Well, what's wrong with this argument? Well, for one, something is not right or wrong based on who believes it. Things have to stand on their own merit. It's not based on whether these people believe it or not. We have to look at information and see, is it true or not, based on its own value. And so that's one of the things wrong with it. And even their premise that none of the rulers believed, that's also wrong. That's also wrong. Because right after this, look at once again the irony. Right after they say none of the rulers believe, Nicodemus speaks up. See how ironic that is? That they just said none of the rulers believe and Nicodemus, one that's right there who has believed, speaks up. Their argument was faulty. But if you turn a couple pages to chapter 12, verse 42... We know that not only Nicodemus had believed, but there were others. John 12, 42 and 43. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. So there were others. There were not, it was not spoken freely because they were afraid of these men who were adamantly enemies of Christ and hostile to him, but there was others who had believed. The irony here is that the leaders are against Christ while 
the officers and the common people are more open to Christ. You see that? The leaders, the ones that had the knowledge, should have been the first ones to identify and believe in Christ are the ones that are against Him. Once again, it's, it's ironic. But aren't you glad that Christ is equally accessible to everyone? There's no advantage to believing in Christ as far as that goes. It's an even playing field, right? There's a lot of things in life that are going to vary a lot based on good looks, talent, motor skills. You know, I went into the Coast Guard. I did a, an, you do a test when you go into the military and they tell you what jobs you qualify for. And there's certain jobs, there's coding, there's electronics, there's this or that, and some of them you're just not, you don't meet the requirement because your skills aren't there. But when we come to pleasing God, those things don't matter. We all have the same opportunity to please God. We all have the same op opportunity of ministry. It's going to be different. But you take the, the Christian that doesn't know that much about the Bible that maybe hasn't been saved that long, but if they have a heart for Christ, you think God isn't going to use them? Watch it. Read church history. You can see many people that God has used because God requires what us to be willing and yield to Him, and all of us have the same ability to do that. And so, that's something that I am thankful for. But we have seen the crowd and now we've seen the officers. Notice the group keeps getting smaller. The crowds, the group of officers, and now we're down to one single person, Nicodemus, for our third scene. These people have been put in a difficult situation. The crowd is divided. The officers are at odds with their superiors because they have the dilemma that they did not obey the orders. And now we see Nicodemus. Verse 50 through 52. And the first thing we know about Nicodemus, there's, a, I'm sure, a lot of men named Nicodemus in Jerusalem at this time, but it identifies who Nicodemus is. It says, who, Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, said to them. So we know this is a Nicodemus from chapter 3 who came to Christ by night who came to talk to Christ. And he has a favorable response as well. In verse 51, he says, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? That's all he said. They were saying, the, the crowd who is ignorant, because they don't know the law, these stupid people over here, they were deceived. So they're using the law. We know the law. These people don't know the law. And, doesn't, and then he chimes in, well, doesn't our law say that we should hear first what he has to say before we make a judgment? He's not even really supporting Christ. He's just saying, shouldn't we be fair and follow the law? Our law, the way we do things, this isn't referring to the Mosaic law necessarily. It's referring to the law, the way they went about doing things, being fair even though the Bible would say we should listen to someone before we make a decision on their case. This seems to be as, as old as Nicodemus could be at this point. Right? And we might say, well, why didn't he say, I believe in Jesus? You guys are saying nobody believes in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Well, he just says something that's slightly, it's not against Christ, it's slightly, it's in his favor, and they already push back, Right? But it seems that Nicodemus has grown bolder from his last visit. He went to Jesus by night, and now he's talking publicly something that could be taken in favor of Christ. But look at the, the pushback in verse 52. They replied, are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. So once again, these people, they're not taking the time to listen and debate or reason with people, anybody that's not totally against Christ, they're going to ridicule you. They're going to push back. They don't have time for arguments. They're just bringing on a strong offensive. They ridicule 
and ask him if he's from Galilee. They know that Nicodemus isn't from Galilee. Nicodemus is one of the top guys. He's the upper crust. He has a lineage that goes back in history of Jerusalem. And yet they ridicule him in this way. And once again, these people that think they're so much better than the crowd, their argument sounds very similar to the crowd, doesn't it? They say, search the scriptures. You're not going to find any prophets from Galilee. Now there's two options here. It's a known fact that there were prophets in the past from Galilee. Any Pharisee knew this. They knew about Jonah. They knew about Nahum. And there was a lot of other ones that probably were from, from Galilee as well. And so either they're so mad that they're just overstating their case and getting into error, as we do when we're mad sometimes, or they're saying the prophet isn't from Galilee. As we talked about before, not a prophet, but the prophet, the prophesied one that would be the prophet greater than Moses. And so it's unclear exactly what their argument here, so it's hard to dismantle it. But at the end of the day, all we know is they were wrong. Because Christ came from Galilee, and he was also from Jerusalem, from Bethlehem, I'm sorry, and from the line of David. So their logic is wrong. But let's step back a minute into Nicodemus' life. Nicodemus has invested his whole life in, the, in getting where he is. He's one of the religious leaders of Israel. He's got a lot of prestige, a lot of power, a lot of money. But he's seen Christ and understanding that Christ is not a deceiver, but he is true. He is the Messiah. He wants Christ, but if he goes for Christ, he's going to lose everything else. Everything else. It's... um. I'm very thankful that this is not the last time we hear about Nicodemus because if not, we'd be left wondering whatever happened to him. There's one more place that we're going to get to eventually, but if we forward a few chapters to John chapter 19, We see that his support for Christ went beyond words. John chapter 19, verses 38 through 40. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So after the crucifixion, Nicodemus and this other secret disciple of Christ make the bold move to go ask for the body and these Powerful, high-class men took the corpse of Christ personally and took care of it and buried him. Where were the disciples? Where were all the loyal followers? They were gone. They were not there. They were not brave enough to do what Nicodemus did. And I'm sure this was found out that he was the one that did it. You can't keep something like that secret. And the tomb probably belonged to one of these two men, Joseph of Arimathea, I believe. And so we see that Nicodemus is on a journey. You know, and it's important to note that because some people come to Christ and it's just all in. The disciples, Jesus said, hey, follow me. And they were all in. But with Nicodemus, we see a different process. And we have to be aware of that because sometimes as we look around, People's experience of salvation may not be exactly like ours. Or we may say, well, they're not saved. Because look, this is how it happened to me. But we have to understand, people come to the Lord in different ways. Obviously, at the end, there should be evidence of salvation and an understanding of the gospel. 
But we have to understand that the Lord works in different ways. And Nicodemus, who started so slowly, so cynical, we see as he's progressing more and more to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. So in conclusion, in the beginning I read Matthew chapter 10 verse 34, but I want to finish that passage. And it's, it goes like this, do, verse 34, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Truly identifying with Christ and consistently identifying with Christ is going to put us at a point where we are at odds with some of the closest people in our lives. It's going to put us at odds with our family and maybe our closest friends and people we work with. In that dilemma, we have to make a decision and it will be clear what we truly value. Do we value Christ enough to count the cost? Are we willing to follow Him wherever He would lead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the words today are a challenge for us as we look at the officers, as we look at Nicodemus, considering Christ and looking at what cost will be paid for following Christ. We, we live in a country where we have many liberties. We live in a country that there isn't widespread persecution or there isn't, even though things look to be changing, there isn't a great price to pay to just say that you're a Christian. But there is a price to be paid for those who want to live as Christ has told us to. We pray that we would be strengthened in our walk with you and that as the price gets steeper, as the cost is higher, that we would not be as those who shrink back, but we would be of those who count the cost and make the sacrifice necessary to please you. In your name we pray, amen.